Welcome to Engine Oil for the Airbus A320 family. All right, uh, what is the objective? Um, obviously, engine oil, we're talking about lubrication of certain components, and uh, we'll be going over some of those and just what makes up uh, the lubrication units. Uh, remember, keep in mind, every time we're working with um, anything under pressure, safety has to come first. So we're just going to go over some safety tips along the way. Uh, you will become familiar with the general concept of the supply circuits, supply circuit and the scavenge circuit. Um, also with the components involved and the locations of them. And I've mentioned this before, I don't know how many times, but three aspects to any system is QTP, quantity, temperature, and pressure. All three of those aspects come into play in regards to the integrity of the operation that's involved. So we want to make sure that we do have the right quantity of oil and as well as the right temperature and pressure at various points. Okay, because we can't really afford to play Russian roulette when it comes to the aircraft and maintenance with it. Uh, there was, there's going to be a test, of course, associated with this subtopic, and um, I'll be mentioning the, the uh, questions along the way. Uh, in fact, I may just introduce a little bit of that to you here in the beginning, just to get you kind of get your feet wet, so to speak, with the questions and what to expect as I'm explaining the material. So please take notes. All right, safety working around jet oil, um, and I can, you probably already know some of the um, problems that have come from putting, and I know I'm switching a little bit, but uh, the two fluids you have are in an aircraft is fuel and oil, and it's very important to ensure that there's the proper uh, oil, you know, for obviously the aircraft, and be, keep this in mind that the oil itself contains toxic ingredients so you don't want to be having your skin exposed to it for a long time you want to make sure you do wear protective personal protective equipment whatever is supplied to you at your MRO but also you may want to uh, read definitely make sure you read uh, what's in the safety manual or go, I'm sure you have safety meetings um, to make sure that you keep that in mind because you know you don't want to have a skin what happens if you get it subcutaneously which is under the skin uh, you, you know it can cause irritation so you need to be careful with that the other thing too with with oil is it can you know it's under pressure so until um, it's not you know it can become a problem uh, a potential danger to you as as you're working around these components so kind of keep that in mind. Uh, make sure your clothing protects as much as your body parts as possible. Okay. Um, you may not care what kind of ingredients are in that jet oil, but there's two particular tricrystal phosphate and the nephil one compound. I won't get to the long name on that one because it is long, but that's part of you know um, the com combination uh, that makes up jet oil. So please be careful when you're working around this. Also, the other thing too is the fumes. Um, just you can, you know, when you're around this, it's you can have the expan uh, expenditure of fumes from that oil. So you don't want to be around that too long, uh, inhaling that, because that could cause some res respiratory issues. Also, all that just goes into your brain. So it's going to be affecting. Perhaps you might feel some dizziness, etc. So again, be careful with all of that. Uh, the eye, eye contact, of course, they say flush out with water. So if you get oil uh, by accident in your eye or eyes, um, you need to seek uh, medical attention right away. You don't want to delay anything that comes in contact. Better to be safe than sorry. Um, don't just brush it off. Okay. All right, that's my thing on jet oil. <laughs> and this, since we're going to be working and talking about it, right, or you're going to be working on it, and I'm going to be talking about it. Uh, indications related to oil. Okay, remember what I said about quantity? We want to make sure there's enough oil in the tank. The oil tank, by the way, is located on the fan case of the engine uh, at the 8 o'clock position. Um, so you'll, and there you have your typical sight glass to kind of see where that level is located. Or, yeah, where that level is as far as the oil in the tank. You also have a supply pump that's going to, you know, move that oil out of the oil tank and get it through the circuit. Um, the other thing too, there's an anti-siphon, siphon, excuse me, siphon, and that's just making sure, again, that, you, that well, making sure that you don't have this um, collection of oil. 
back in. Um, how much is enough? So back on quantity, I mentioned about the level. Um, do follow, of course, what's in the manual as far as the quantity of oil, minimum quantity that's necessary, and then also whatever is necessary for that, you know, for that flight for the for the, for the aircraft to fly. Um, obviously, it's not going to be exact, but um, it's going to be that minimum quantity plus, you know, extra. Okay, so be aware of that. Um, the indications that you have uh, in the uh, cockpit. Okay, you're going to have uh, also, you know, you're going to have that indication as far as the quantity with the oil um, that's going to be in there. Of course, once you do the check on the oil level, I mean, if it's too low, you're going to need to fill it. Um, after you do that, though, you're, you need to put that warning tag, you know, in the cockpit that, you know, it's, you know, to just let people know it's not to be operated. So um, there's that. Also, the oil filter. Of course, there's filters throughout all systems. And here, you know, I know if you got through already the fuel part of um, the fuel lesson, if you know, just like we have to have, you know, ice free, clean fuel, we need to have also clean oil um, and at the right viscosity, et cetera. So this is all, you know, the oil gets affected by temperature, right? So it's important that that oil be in the condition that needs to be. Uh, in order to be effective with the lubrication. Um, the oil filter is helping with part of that. So there is an oil filter clogging indication um, that lets, you know, it gives a warning if there's a, a filter clog. So we want to make sure we can have that filter working. Okay. This is, I'm just kind of giving you a brush stroke or a helicopter's view on just, you know, the oil tank, you know, what it has there as far as indication with the uh, the quantity, and like I said, we're going to get to more of the temperature and the pressure and some of the components involved with that, just to make sure again that the oil is where it needs to be. All right, so let's go ahead and get into this. Uh, what components, um, you know, are make up the lubrication system, and what do we need the lubrication system for? Okay, well, you have a lubrication system, um, and by the way, just like in other systems as well, even in hydraulic systems. You're, you're, there, it's separated and basically it's isolated. Okay, it doesn't come into contact, you know, with any other or gets mixed with any other system or subsystem. It's just pretty much in its own little world. So that's just think about that. It's it's its own mechanism, if you will. And the you know, with the lubrication system, you know, what do we need to lubricate? Okay, we're, what's our objective? We have oil in the oil tank that's going to lubrication units, kind of like the middleman saying, okay, I have these, you know, I've got filters, but I also ha need a way to distribute that oil to what? Okay, what's our end result? Our end result is getting that oil or the lubrication to um, the components. In particular, we're talking about the engine bearings, the gearboxes. Um, but not only is it for lubrication, we're also needing to cool um, some components, and that's another function of the lubrication okay that we have here so we have the distribution of you know of the the oil that's going through nozzles and then you know we have after that oil gets distributed we were let's say for example the accessory gearbox then what you know we have some of that residue you know obviously you know it's lubrication has done its job but now we've got to return some of that oil so that that's that other circuit we have number one the supply circuit okay meeting that objective I just mentioned and number two we have what's called a scavenge circuit and that's basically grabbing a hold of the you know remaining oil from those areas where we needed that lubrication and bringing some of that back into the oil tank and the condition that the oil needs to be in because after it's done its work because anytime there's work there's heat that's expended right if you remember from the AMP days if you have your AMP license um, you know anytime work is expended you're, you're going to have a byproduct of heat and that's exactly what happens with the oil after it's been used up if you are used some of it's used up because some of there's some some evaporation with that because of the heat but now you have hot oil and we don't want to have too hot of oil going back into the oil tank so we've got a process where we're or a circuit where we're going through servo heaters the oil um, um, the oil fuel exchanger uh, exchanger heat exchanger to get some of that 
you know, dissipate some of that heat before it goes back into the oil tank. Okay, so that's kind of giving you a, a kind of a helicopter's view, pretty good view actually, of kind of the chain of events and the objectives that we have with those two different circuits. Um, and that's, you know, what we have. All right, and of course, with the lines that we have, the lines are obviously going from the oil tank. And by the way, from the oil tank, you've got, you know, the, like I said, you got filters because you've got to have, make sure you have filtered oil along the way. But then you have those tappings in the line because why? You know, we need to get, you know, those, we need to get the oil distributed to the different areas where it's needed. And you, so there, therefore you have those. You have pumps, different pumps throughout the circuits. You have one supply pump I just mentioned earlier, uh, in the oil tank, because you're going to have, um, you don't need to get that oil moving, obviously, and then it to be getting it to be pressurized. Then you have four scavenge pumps, okay, to bring that oil back. Okay, this is all under pressure, and you have to have a certain amount of pressure. Roughly, it's about thirty. You know, I would say roughly, okay, roughly about 35 psi of pressure that that oil needs to be going or ha be at running through the line for distribution to the nozzles that go and spray, you know, in those to those components that need it. For example, engine bearings. Okay, um, your uh, your displace your pumps that I mentioned, uh, whether it's your four scavenge pumps uh, and the supply pump, all of those are the same type of pump. Um, I don't know. There's a whole, you can do, there's so many different kinds of pumps, but just so you have a, an awareness of what kind this is, this is a um, pretty standard, but actually, Durotor uh, type po positive displacement pumps. There's different kinds of pumps, gear pumps, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this one's just, you know, pretty standard for the application in this particular application that we're talking about. Okay. Um, all those pumps are actually driven by a drive sh or by a, um, a drive shaft, okay? That's running, and being moved by the accessory gearbox, okay? So just so you know, how many scavenge pumps do we have? Four. And how many supply pumps do we have? We have one. Okay, I'm going to jump a little bit. Not really jumping, but I just want to. Make sure I cover some of the practice questions, which by the way, hint, hint, you probably will see on the test. Um, and there could be between 20, well, more, more likely probably more than 20 questions in, in all, as far as you know, any of these subtopics, but this one could be between 25 and 30, 30 something questions. So be prepared, take notes right now. Um, question to you, what does the lubrication unit consist of? Okay, is it, you have two choices. One, is it three positive displacement pumps or five? Okay, I just mentioned to you, it's five. All right, it's one supply pump and one and four uh, scavenge pumps. Okay, number two, what is the lubrication, where is the lubrication unit located? Okay, I mentioned it was on the fan case, but I will um, mention, uh, obviously on the fan case, but um, is it the right side or the left side? Okay, it's actually the right-hand side of the accessory gearbox front face. And how many servo fuel heaters are part of the lubrication distribution system? Okay, I haven't mentioned that yet, but again, I'm throwing it out there. Um, there are zero. Okay, <laughs> how many servo fuel heaters are part of the of the lubrication distribution system? It seems like a, tr a trick question. Um, I don't mean to trip you up. This is not, these questions are not designed, by the way, to trick you. You do need to read the question, but uh, um, this is not going to be too complex. We're just, I just want to have you, could just basically to raise your awareness. Okay, so when you walk away, you have more familiarity than you had before. Okay, that's the bottom line. That's our objective. Um, describe the sequence of how the pumps take in oil. Uh, okay. I'm just going to tell you here, there's an, there's an initial half cycle, and when that volume increases, okay, then you have that increase, which what creates a, a partial vacuum when it does, and that's it's basically when you're causing a vacuum, you're creating a suction effect, and that's what that's about. And that's what happens in that first part. So um, that's the that's the answer. That's the answer there. So. And I'm just, again, mentioning a few things here for you. All right, so let's go back to our 
thought here on the oil tank where everything is starting because that's where the oil is located and that's what we want to get from point A, the oil tank, to B, point B, which is going to be a mo several places actually. All right, so here what do we have? What's, what's what the general idea um, and what p parts do we have in this thing? Well, for one, we got to, we have to have uh, filters. Um, there's different filters. We also have a clogging indicator transmitter because we want to make sure that that is being um, indicated on, um, in the cockpit, right? So we need to have that clogging transmitter when the oil filter is is you know is indicating it's, it's clogged. We want to make sure that we know that. And there's also the bypass valve. Um, you got a pressure gauge also and a temperature sensor. And we'll talk a little bit more on the temperature part as well as pressure. All right. So what do you have? Also, remember I mentioned the anti siphon. Um, you have a, the supply line. Remember, it's going from the oil tank, okay, you, so that it can get to the lubrication units to get to the uh, distribution nozzles. Um, that supply line. Well, in that supply line is, is installed a device, and that device there prevents um, the tank from basically draining into the gearboxes when the engines shut down. So it's a protective measure. So that anti-siphon, just think of it as a protective device in the circuit. And that's usually, and like I said, that's just, you know, when the engines just shut down um, so it doesn't uh, drain um, the tank. Okay. Now the temperature sensor and pressure switch, um, pressure, pressure switch, you have a signal that's used by the ECAM system. Um, and that's to uh, obviously give the invocation for the filter clog. And then also a temperature sensor. Um, the temperature sensor is going to be on the filter housing of the lubrication unit. Okay, you have a lub that lubrication unit I mentioned before. And by the way, what you're seeing here on the diagram, um, there's a supply area and, and um, a supply and a scavenge area. It's part of the like, lubrication um, unit. And um, so you have this, and um, basically on here with the lubrication. Uh, unit. Um, this is provided by the oil that's bled from obviously get, getting from the supply pump discharge circuit uh, and that's going to enter there and go you know um, through the conduit of the uh, drive shaft. Okay but just kind of mentioning the sensors that you have along the way is the pressure switch and you have a temperature sensor okay and then that oil clog um, transmitter or yeah, transmitter so it can give that uh, indication or message to the ECAM. Okay, and just to mention again what it's um, what the oil is used for. It's it is lubricating the engine bearings and the accessory gearbox, uh, as well as the TGB. Okay, your transfer gearbox. Now, one of the problems that um, it that is inherent with oil. Um, if you haven't or don't remember, if you ever have, if you haven't had a lesson on oil, the whole thing's fascinating, actually. But anyway, that in itself, just talking about oil, um, is is fascinating. Or if you're even with hydraulic fluid as well, just as a topic by itself, is fascinating. Um, I mean, oil's oil, right? But there's there's just the reason I mention that is because you have the danger of air being mixed in the oil and that's not what we want. So th there is a, a separator, a device uh, component to basically separate the air out of the oil um, and just basically what they call aerating. Well, that's what aeration means. It means, you know, removing the, getting the air out. Okay, so just so you know, you do have that component as part of it. Um, the other thing too, you know, the oil can, can, can accumulate or attract little debris. Um, could be a little metal chips, little metal particles or particulates that come from just being around the gearboxes and the engines and we don't want to have that either. So another part or another component of that whole lubrication system uh, circuit is the chip metal um, magnetic chip detectors. So you have those as well being able to attract magnetically uh, the metal out away from that oil and out of the oil. All right. So, and uh, the, just kind of th there's that. And then you, the other thing too that you have um, on the scavenge circuit 
um, is your plugs. You have there's basically screens um, with these plugs, and um, just so you know that those are there. Uh, you're, you also have the fuel heater, your your main oil fuel heat exchanger. Um, the servo fuel heater, just kind of a side note. It's not really part of the lubrication. It's it's there, but it's not considered part of the the um, the lubrication system. Now the oil fuel heat exchanger is considered part of it, and they serve the same purpose. I mean, both of these components in that circuit are there to cool the oil before it goes back to the oil tank. Okay, so if you're ever tested, ever asked a question, you know, what's the function of the servo heater? or the oil fuel heat exchanger um, it's to cool the oil let you know make it less warm before it, you know less hot before it, it goes back to the oil tank okay all right um, and I mentioned also remember about the oil, air oil mixture um, that you've got to you know there's that aerator to separate that out um, you also have that magnetic chip d detector that will be um, positioned in that system as well to attract attract those little metal pieces. Okay. All right. And um, again, I you know don't really want to belabor you know talking about that. It's you know the concept is simple as far as what it does. Okay. Um, the details as far as um, the the filters. There's different kinds of filters that are used. Just know that they are, there are different ones. Make sure you do pay attention to the serial numbers, obviously, on them when you're switching them out, because some of them look very much alike, and you might mistake one for the you know for another, and it's not really the same. And you and the reason why it's not is because they're rated differently, right? I mean, you probably know that, but filter ratings, you know, there are so many different um, ratings in microns for these filters. And again, they look the same. There's a filter, there's a filter, but you know, what is it rated? So you want to make sure that you're replacing, you know, like for like, um, not by visual, but by serial number. Okay, visual meaning just you're looking at the canister or you're looking at, you know, basically that the cylindrical uh, filter, there it is, or whatever. And you're like, oh, that looks like the one I ha I'm having, you know, in the warehouse to switch out. Well, it's not going to work. Um, it may fit, but my point is, is you want to just pay attention to things like that when you're, um, if you need to switch out any filters. Okay. Uh, also, um, part of the, the system we have is the sump. Um, you've got the sumps. Um, you also have the sump vent subsystem, so you're getting some of the air, or that, you know, basically the air um, out. Um, and so you have that. This, basically, the sump is vented um, to remove the air um, which enters there. So that's that's all that's for. I mean, just like your vent surge tanks that in the fuel um, system, you're just you're just it's just a way to really get some of that out. And there's those vents for that purpose. Okay. All right. Um, the other thing too um, that you have, um, I know I mentioned before, is the uh, I said temperature sensor, and you also have the oil pre oil pressure switch. Um, there's a transmitter because in the cockpit, right, we want to know what's the oil pressure like. We need to have it at a certain level um, coming out of the tank. Remember I said roughly about 35. It, there's a range there, but I'm, I don't, don't get hung, hung up on numbers. Um, the main thing is looking at your indications and where um, those um, indicators should be on the, re, you know, on the ECAM. So, but it really is somewhere around 30, 35 PSI. Um, the oil, oil pressure transmitter um, it just enables that oil pressure within the system to be monitored, obviously, and so that it can be showing up on that ECAM. Okay, so you have that. Um, the low pressure oil switch, low pressure switch. Okay, it's your oil, low oil pressure switch. Um, that is um, obviously there, you know, to let the crew know that they're low, low on oil. Okay, um, and just to note on the fl on the flow when that pressure um, that oil is pressurized you have it going to the forward sump because you've got different engine bearings right and if you recall if you've taken a, a class um, in power plant I'm talking strictly on the engine construction um, there are diagrams to show the different number of bear numbers I should say number the numbered bearings and where they're located and 
you know, what you have. So with the forward stump, you've got bearings one, two, three, and the aft stump, you have four and five. And you also have the accessory gearbox um, that it goes through. So you have that flowing, you know, going on there to have the lubrication of those engine bearings, okay, as well as the AGB, your accessory gearbox, which then after that goes into the TGB, that's your transfer gearbox. All right. All right, so we have supply pump to pressurize the oil to go to the engine bearings, to go to the accessory gearbox and the transfer gearbox. Well, now we've got to remove some of that oil, getting it back out. And here's where we come into the four scavenge pumps. So you have four scavenge pump elements that take away that oil from the engine bearing sumps okay, and the gearbox. Uh, and it's going to be returning that back to the oil tank. Okay, and it's got to cool it, so just remember it has to cool that. Okay, I'm going to throw in a few test questions because right, I didn't want to be remiss with, with some of these and not mentioning them, but all right, I know I haven't covered it, but here's the test, here's a, here's a question. Okay, what flow rate is created by the supply element at takeoff, okay, at aircraft takeoff, at a normal pressure of 60 psi? Okay. Um, what flow rate is created by the supply element at takeoff? Okay, I want to tell you that that's actually 2,495 liters per hour. Um, just remember that it's a four digit, not a three digit. So if another answer is only three digits, it's wrong. It's a wrong answer. All right, um, it's actually 2,495 liters per hour, roughly. So that, that's the rate at which um, you have that um, flow rate. Um, what's the normal pressure range of the oil? Um, I put it in bars. If you want to uh, convert that to PSI, um, then that comes roughly to about 35 PSI. The bars are going to be between 2.5 and 2.7 bars. Just another unit of measure. Okay. Um, let's have about another one and then we'll go back to our lesson. Uh, what controls the distribution of oil to the demand components? Is it the ports or the spray nozzles? Okay, I can't mention about nozzles. So the answer is spray nozzles, right? We have at the distribution, we have spray nozzles that are going to be spraying in those um, to the components that need it. Okay, all right. So let's kind of take a back back here and kind of go into a little bit more. All right, with um, the oil, I you know covered oil tank. Oil tank um, has a vent tube. It has the oil level transmitter. Um, you know, obviously has the sight glass on there, so you can see what the level is. And of course, for fill, ref, you know, filling it up, um, you have a couple of different filling ports for that. Um, be aware, and I, you know, our we have our, our commercial airline pilot on board. <laughs> Probably not intended, by the way on uh, Operation Aviation. He's uh, one of our instructors. He will share more about that because he's seen it with aircraft mechanics, with line mechanics, um, to be careful that, you know, after the engine is shut down, um, you need to let the oil tank pressure calm. Just like with anything, right? Give it some time to kind of cool off a little bit, kind of cool, calm down. But that's what you want to do. Don't just immediately, right, open up the, the, tank, the uh, cap, the filler cap and because, you know, you don't want to have something come right into your face. You know, there's no such thing as common sense in my book. Um, because what's common to one person could be not common to another, depending on people's backgrounds and experience. So I don't take anything for granted on that note. Um, just be aware that you want to be careful and give it some time. Don't be in a rush, although I know it can be, you know, you can be under pressure as far as your work and all, but... Um, you need to be safe first or you won't be working if something happens to you. So be careful with removing that filler cap, okay? Also, uh, don't manhandle it, okay? I don't need to be saying, or, you know, yeah, if it doesn't move, if there's some, you know, like just normally if you're trying to actually um, turn it and it's stuck and it doesn't go and you're trying to force it, put extra force to it, then something's wrong. Okay, don't don't put too much in into it because then you're gonna damage it and don't want that. 
Okay. And there's uh, obviously indications um, on the uh, indications, or should I say labels, for you to see. But, you know, obviously follow your manual and, and uh, make sure that you also be careful with the fumes. Remember I said about uh, fumes from fluid. Well, what two fluids do we have in an aircraft? We have the oil that we're talking about right now and also fuel. And obviously, you do, you're, you know, you've got the oil tank on the fan case, you have it there near the engine, so they, you know, it can supply that oil to the engine components. So it has to be physically nearby. But be careful because, you know, after shutdown, uh, um, you know, you're going to have some fumes that might be there from the fuel. Okay. There shouldn't be a mixture, there should not, okay, let me repeat, there should not be a mixture of fuel with oil. So, kind of be aware if something doesn't smell right <laughs> it probably isn't right and I would you know suggest you do a little further investigation okay all right um, kind of before you, you do some things kind of just a quick thing on procedures and again I'm not this is not this is just for <laughs> informational purposes I'm saying follow step for step at your MRO follow the manufacturers uh, publications etc on, on what to do here on the oil filling oil in the oil tank but here you know you want to add oil you can do it through the gravity port filling um, port or you could do it through the remote um, filling port. There's two ports on the oil tank. And you, so and just to know there's both of those. Um, and the other thing too you want to be aware of just from a visual inspection um, is make sure that the o-ring seal is not worn because if it is, <laughs> right, it's called a seal for a reason. You don't want to have a leak of, of from that point and that that cap. You want to make sure that oil, uh, uh, excuse me, that oil O-ring seal is is not cracked or broken, whatever. Okay. Okay. All right, and make sure too that the oil tank um, filler cap is locked properly, because if you don't, you're not then you're not creating that pressurized system or pressurized world there and if that happens then obviously it's not going to you're not going to have there's not going to be a good um pressure you know for operation okay so that's that's with the um the oil tank itself and kind of a little bit about oil pressure now uh you know as far as the tank itself um, you know, it's, you know, it is holding the oil, so it's important to pay attention to the condition of it as well, um, and just know a little bit about, you know, its capacity. Um, the maximum, okay, on the tank itself, as far as quick characteristics that we have, um, maximum unusable oil, oil, no matter at what attitude, because remember, you know, we have different um, attitudes of the aircraft in which the levels can be different, things can be different there as far as we can, it's holding, but it's 2.5 U.S. quarts, okay, that max, that unusable oil. Um, and there's just other information about the tank um, that probably you wouldn't remember, nor is it really that important. But um, again, just just pay attention to uh, the, the levels and, and just know a little bit about um, the operation on filling. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So we have uh, that, and then also remember I mentioned about how air can get into the oil, and there has to be a way to separate those two components. Okay. So we do have a separator, and in the, the there's the oil in there's an oil in tube port. Okay. Um, as part of that, and it, that there is connected to the t tank vent because that way it can go through the oil, the have the oil mixture there to the and go to the separator. Okay, and that separator is where it separates that air out and then aerates it and gets it actually vented out. Okay. Okay. All right, so uh, let's kind of go a little bit on the 
um, pressure, I did a little bit about the oil, uh, te the temperature sensor. So let's kind of go over that a little bit and then we'll, but in the meantime, let's, let's kind of, I don't want to forget mentioning these questions to you because there's there several questions. There's no, I mean, you're going to be wondering, well, gee, that's a lot of material. What am I going to be tested on? All right, so let's kind of kind of cover some questions, get some ground, more ground on this one. All right, um, what side of, which side of the fan case is the oil tank mounted in the Airbus A320? Okay, is it the 8 o'clock position or the 4 o'clock? Okay, I mentioned that before. It's the 8 o'clock position. To install the oil tank, you'll need two upper and two lower mounts. I know I didn't mention this, but this is part of your lesson here. To install the oil tank, you need two upper and two lower. Is that true or false? That's actually not true because you only need one upper mount, not two. There's two in the two lower mounts you're using, but you only need the one on the top. There's only one upper one. Okay. What is the normal operating pressure of the oil tank regardless of attitude of the plane? Is it eight tenths of a bar above external pressure or two bar above external pressure? Okay, that's actually an eighth of a an eight tenths of a bar. Okay, so 0 0.8 bar above external pressure. Okay, that's the normal operating pressure of the oil tank. Okay, what is the first thing you need to make sure of before opening the filler cap to the oil tank? Is it make sure the engine is off? Probably that'd be a good idea too, okay, but, or is it B, what I mentioned before, okay, make sure the engine is off and has been shut down for at least five minutes. So I said, okay, give it some time. Uh, kind of rule of thumb is five minutes. All right, so that's the first thing you need to do to make sure or make sure of before you open that filler cap is to let it, you know, s s shut down and be shut down for five minutes. All right, when removing the filler cap, one is a caution, what um, is a cautious action that you want to take? Okay, is it remove it firmly but not aggressively or remove the top lid on it first, then turn the handle? Okay, it's actually the, f the first answer. Remember I said just do it firmly, um, but if it's taking you extra effort to do that and you're really forcing it, uh, you do not want to do that. It's, you're, you'll damage it. All right, let's do a couple more and then we'll go and, and talk a little bit about the temperature sensor. All right, name the order of the lubrication scavenge oil circuit. Okay, is it A, you have the heat exchanger, chip detector, and servo fuel heater? or the chip detector, servo heater, and heat exchanger. Okay, you're getting an order right now. Okay, the answer is actually the second answer. Um, it actually goes through the chip detector, then the servo heater, and heat exchanger. Think about this. You've got to take the, any little metal um, particulates, any little d debris like that, needs to get out of the oil <laughs> before you're going to cool it before it goes to the oil tank. So, you know, that's the order, not any other order. Okay, how many pumps are used to scavenge the oil after it lubricates its main components? Okay, I remember I said there's four scavenge pumps. All right, so you got an idea on that. Okay, so let's, let's kind of go a little bit more. Um, actually, you know, we're going to talk about the temperature sensor, and you can be hanging up on that, right? <laughs> But um, I wanted you to understand oil temperature is very important. Um, you know, it can cause damage to components if it's, that oil is too hot. Um, just in general, as far as just, I mean, there's obviously the aircraft, especially the engines, are made, you know, with the structural integrity of the metal to handle high temperatures. I mean, that's a given. But oil temperature, um, it, you know, it needs to be not too hot. So with here you have a single uh, uh, element that's sensing the oil temperature and um, we can get into the electri electrical part of the whole thing, but this element is basically causing the change in the in the resistance of that. Um, when, the, when the temperature changes, then it's going to be sensitive to that and give an indication in, on the in-cam. Um, the temperature measurement range of this um, temperature sensor, okay, of this element, 
is between negative 58 degrees Fahrenheit to 392 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a pretty wide range. Okay, and the oil temperature indicating, um, only the oil temperature for the engine condition monitoring is indicated. Not any other um, kind of oil or oil um, anywhere else. It's actually just the oil temperature for the engine condition that's going to show up there on the ECAM um, through the FWCs, KL, you have, um, and also the DMC. Um, that fl um, advisory level, when you have the oil temperature at a certain, um, adv just at the advisory level, it's going to be flashing in green. Um, green means that the temperature of that oil is higher than 284 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty hot. Okay, but you know, it is running through there, um, serving its purpose. But just so you know, it's a flashing green. Um, indication when it's greater than 284 degrees Fahrenheit. Now the indication um, becomes amber and of course remember with amber light the uh, you always have that pairing with the master caution light. So the master caution light is going to come on when the temperature is higher than 311 degrees Fahrenheit. So we went from 284 degrees to 311 degrees Fahrenheit where we have these markers if you will of indication and you know, and, and warning colors. So we have the flashing of green at 284 and then it becomes amber at 311 degrees, which we know the master caution light will come on at, at that time. Um, it's going to do, um, and that's assuming that the temperature goes up to that 311 for 15 minutes. So there, it's, it's lingering. If it just stay for five minutes, it's not going to stay uh, on like that. It's, it's, it's not, but if it's lingering, you know, for 15 minutes, that's, that's when it becomes a problem or something that needs to be addressed. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So they kind of give you an idea there on the actual ECAM for inch one, inch two, you're going to see that on there either oil, oil high temp. Okay. So that's the, that's the wording on the ECAM. It'll say oil high temp. All right. Now, um, we also have the engine oil temperature that was for engine condition, but we also have the engine oil temperature sensor for the IDG cooling system control. Um, so this here, um, this particular sensor is located above the oil tank and on the oil supply tube that's to the forward bearing sump and that runs at about the nine o'clock position. Okay, so this is the difference. This is the engine oil temperature sensor for the IDG cooling system control. Um, this is here a sensor. There's different kinds of sensors. This one in particular is a thermocouple, um, dual type, I should say, a dual type thermocouple. Um, you have two different metals um, that are, it's just engineered that way for this purpose. Okay. Um, so, anyway, got the details on that. Obviously, if a sensor is uh, considered faulty, has been found to be faulty, we're just going to have to switch that out. Okay. All right. So we have um, that, the monitoring, like I mentioned before, um, you know, on the, the temperature sensor, sensor um, this one's located uh, on the oil pressure filter. This is for the engine con uh, condition. I know just a bit ago I just mentioned for IDG um, cooling control, Mo you know, but here on the oil temperature sensor for the engine condition monitoring, this one is located on the oil pressure filter that's downstream of the pressure pump. Okay, um, oil temperature is sensed by this, you know, sensor, um, and its range is a little bit. It's about well, about the, it's the same. So negative 58 degrees to 392 degrees. So it's the same, you know, same range as, as the other sensor. Okay. All right. Okay, um, that kind of gives you an idea on the sensors. Um, all right, so we, we talked a little bit about the, um, that we got the quantity, right? So we immediately we're talking about, or you got introduced to the um, quantity, looking at the level of the oil and then also servicing it, you know, and how to, you know, fill, it, fill the oil tank up to where it needs to be, um, minimum quantity, et cetera, plus extra for, you know, the consumption, consumptive um, aspect, making sure there's enough oil for cons consumption for the aircraft in flight. Um, also, the um, 
pressure transmitter and also the temperature sensors. And now I want to just touch on the magnetic chip detector. The magnetic chip detectors, um, there's actually four of them and they consist of a sleeve. Um, you've got the magnetic plug assembly because you need a magnet there to attract the metal particulates that are in the oil and then also a spool. Um, you've got a metal a mesh screen that's spring-loaded uh, with or has a spring-loaded pin to the to lock the screen in position. You have the magnetic magnetic bar there to attract, like I said, those magnetic particles that are you know in the oil, um, and you you know so you have that kind of idea there. Um, just also um, you the little bit of description on this on the spool um, that spool is insta installed in a bore of the lubri lubrication unit housing. So that's where you'll find that. And, um, you know, as far as the magnetic plug uh, assembly itself, um, when you remove it, well, the spring's going to push the spool into the sleeve. Okay, so the way the mechanism is. Um, okay. And then as far as just, you know, examining the chip detector, um, you need to just be careful, to, you know, just pay attention to what's there. Um, you don't want to, um, you know, also ha want to ID it properly. I, mean, I mentioned that before about serial numbers and making sure that you have identification um, of the actual chip detector. Okay. All right. And just kind of a, you know, if you haven't worked on anything with, uh, you know, I've talked to some of you, actually a lot of you, um, and it seems that at least the majority, the ones I talked to were structures people, and then there's power plant, power plant technicians. So, I mean, there's some, some of you have never even worked on power plant at all, and the reason I bring that up is because in structures you're not dealing with O-rings and seals and, and not like that, so you, you need to, you know, with power plant you've got all these m places where um, you have fluid running. Every time you have fluid, you have to have seals. So here I mentioned that because O-rings can go out depending on you know what, which or you know I guess the quality of them. But you know O-rings can be really worn just by the nature of what they are there for. So do make sure that you are switching out O-rings. You know pay, visually inspecting, making sure they're in good condition. Uh, obviously, if they're not then, uh, you know, switch them out and get a new O-ring in, in those places, okay? Because you don't want to have a, a loss of oil. Um, whether it's fuel leaks, oil leaks, nobody wants that, especially the pilot. So, you know, we don't want to have a problem where we have a leak that's causing damage to other components while in flight uh, or otherwise. Okay. All right, that kind of gives you an idea. I covered quite a bit. Um, wasn't you know, kind of give you an idea on the supply circuit with scavenge circuit. You have oil t from the oil tank. You've got that flow of oil going to uh, through filters that are going to go to lubrication units, basically to distribute through nozzles um, the oil to the engine bearings, the accessory gearbox, then to the transfer gearbox. Um, so all to those bearings: one, two, three, four, five. Okay, and your forward and aft sump of the engine. Um, also. A little bit on being able to keep the oil clean along the way before it comes back and also in cooling it. Uh, we also talked about pressure, making sure that the oil is at a certain pressure. The supply sh sh uh, pressure should be at around 35. Okay, normal operating pressure at 30, roughly 35 PSI. PSI. Okay, and that roughly comes to about 2.3, 2.4 bar. Um, that's just another unit of measure. Okay, as far as its uh, conversion to that. Okay, let me go ahead and finish out some of these test questions for you. All right, let's kind of go to, um, I know I didn't mention before, but I'm going to, you're going to get it now. Okay, what is the indication flash green? Remember I mentioned that green uh, flash as an indication. Uh, when the oil temperature is higher than 140 degrees or when the oil temperature is higher than 125 Okay, roughly. Okay, at some point I was saying 284 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, this is in Celsius. Celsius is 140 degrees Celsius. But you know, if you see if you see 140 degrees Celsius, see that's for Celsius. 
Um, that's the same as the 284, 284 degrees Fahrenheit. How does the low oil pressure switch get triggered? Okay, um, is it through um, 16 or excuse me, 11 psi increasing pressure or 16 psi increasing pressure? Okay, I didn't mention the 16, but I'm mentioning it now. Um, that low oil pressure switch gets triggered at 16. Okay, so just remember that because oil pressure has to be at a certain level. Remember, I said roughly about 35. And it does fluctuate, so it's not a big thing. But if it hits 16 psi, that's 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 <laughs> quite a deal lower than that 35 psi. So once it hits that 16, um, um, estimated um, increasing pressure, then it's it's gonna it's gonna trigger. Okay, that switch is gonna trigger, and there's gonna be an indication for a low for low pressure. All right. Um, we'll let's see. How about um, okay. How about this? When when does the indication flash amber and the mashing master caution light comes on? Okay. Um, I know I said 311 degrees Fahrenheit. If you see it on the test as Celsius, that's going to be 155 degrees Celsius. I hope you have a pen and paper in your hand right now. Please take notes. Okay. So if you see. Um, 155 degrees Celsius, that's the same as the um, 311 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, remember I said that there's there's that green light will come on at 284 degrees Fahrenheit, and then if it gets higher and higher, all the temperature is higher, then you're gonna you're gonna to 311, that's gonna be the trigger where that amber light is gonna come on, which automatically the master master caution light comes on. Okay. All right, where's the oil temperature sensor for the ECU? Okay, this is for the IDG cooling in particular. Is it the main, is it located um, at the main oil filter housing of the lubrication system or above the oil tank on the oil supply tube? Okay, it's the last answer. It's, it's a, located above the oil tank on the oil supply tube. All right, um, let's try another one. Where is the oil pressure transmitter? and the oil pressure switch located. Okay, is it on the lubrication unit inlet line or on the lubrication unit outlet line? Okay, it is on the outlet line. Okay, when the bypass valve opens in the event of a clogged filter, no maintenance is necessary since the operation continues. Is that true or false? I know, sometimes you're going to get a true-false question. Okay, that answer is false. Just because there's a bypass valve that allows you know oil to still go, doesn't go through, doesn't mean that we just ignore the fact that we have a clogged filter. I mean, we have a clogged filter indication on the ECAM. It cannot be ignored. Okay, all right. Um, let's see. How about, okay, how about one more? Um, okay, here's, here's, here's one for you. Take notes. When is the scavenge filter clogged? Okay, was it when the differential pressure reaches 25.5 psi or 15.5? All right, you're getting the information right now, so write it down. Um, when is the scavenge filter clogged? Okay, it's actually the first answer. It is clogged when the differential pressure reaches 25.5 psi. Okay. All right. And if you want to learn a lot more detail about any of this, seriously, if you do, um, let us know. Um, and we'll, we'll try also to get more videos out, or just audio, by the way, on um, specific p parts to it. I mean, some of you are actually interested in more of this. Some of you, that's okay if you're not um, too much into that. You just want to say, you know, I got I got what I needed, you know, um, that gives me the familiarity and I want to move on. <laughs> it's completely fine too. All right. Okay. So that pretty much does it. Um, I did cover a lot of the practice questions, you know, you will see again. I'm going to just tell you, you will see it again. Uh, if you need, if you have questions about um, maybe you missed an answer or whatever, just uh, you know, email us and, and we'll help you through um, to get that answer for you. 
All right, well, I enjoyed uh, presenting this to you, and I hope you learned a lot, and I look forward to uh, 